Welcome to Victims and Villains, a podcast extension of the nonprofit that educates and engages individuals like yourselves on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture. My name is Captain Nostalgia, and I am joined by Alan Cram, our Marvel correspondent, co-host of You Have to Watch This Podcast, videographer. His resume just goes on and on and on. Happy to be here. Although, it, we're in my car right now, so I feel like you're the guest, but happy to be here. I mean, for this this occasion, uh, but we're talking about, uh, we're here at Creature Feature Weekend, and before we tease and talk about some of the uh, interviews that we were able to uh, obtain with small creators, filmmakers, and musicians, uh, musicians and also celebrities, uh, we wanted to kind of just talk about the the weekend as a whole that we were able to do. Um, so spoiler alert, we'll put this, put this out there that, uh, we only were here Friday, Saturday. This is an all weekend event here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, but yeah, we're, what kind of stuff you want to jump into first? I mean, I think we just start off with, uh, Friday night, the kickoff. We were able to attend the VIP event with, uh, Carnival again, friends of the show who were on last year talked a lot about their mental health process and it's a great episode if you can go back and listen to that got to see their show again uh got to talk to them again and catch up and see some new stuff that they did uh they brought out a straight jacket which i was not expecting which was very entertaining broke the theater in the process uh i will neither confirm or deny that (laughs) i i did not see their show but i was at uh a live commentary for a nightmare on Elm street 2 uh with mark Patton, whose interview you guys will hear later this week and uh director uh jack shoulder who i did not get a chance to interview but that commentary was probably one of the best live experiences i've ever had or best theatrical experience i've had this year yeah i didn't get to go to that because of the vip event but um, it sounded like it was an interesting time. I've never seen Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and so I didn't want to go and see it with the commentary for the first time. I figure if I'm going to see that, I should see it pure. Yeah, so Nightmare on Elm Street 2 is interesting because it's such a diversion from the first film and subsequently every film that follows. But to like get to... It was an interesting mix because Jack is a film professor, so that's his gift by trade. And uh, so he was kind of like talking about like a lot of like the nuances of making the movie, whereas uh, Mark, on the other hand, was kind of talking about the legacy of the movie, uh, acting and kind of like what this role kind of meant to his career. And uh, he even teased about uh, his mental health in uh, the the interview we did with him. But. I just want to plug it again. Uh, go check out Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, it's a great documentary uh, talking about Nightmare on Elm Street too. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that I've noticed this year compared to last year, and I don't even think it's just us, is uh, the f- the variety of films isn't as much as it was last year. I feel like last year it was more film heavy. This time, this time around it seems more panel heavy. Because uh, we, we were able to attend two panels today. This is the second day of the convention. Uh, between the two of us, we saw two panels. Uh, and we've only seen three short films today so far. We are planning on going to a few more after we record this. But th- I thought it was interesting that the films, have, the number of films have seemed to shift. And it, they seem to be more panel heavy this year, which I'm fine with. Well, so it's interesting that you say that because this time last year and even the first year when I was here, the way that they would do stuff is they essentially like theater where they do it at is they block off the first two theaters Mm -hmm. for the event. And the first one just is mostly like the first and second one have always kind of been uh, movies, whereas this year you're right, like this year they opened up the first film and it primarily had panels whereas in the second theater they used mostly for uh the 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 films and i was able to actually see a couple of the short films that they aired this year uh you caught a couple too Mm -hmm. um i don't know necessarily that i want to talk about those 
just because some of them might potentially be coming up in horrific hope uh, our next season. I mean, I'll, I'll say a little bit about them. The ones that I saw were from people that I knew uh, being uh, involved in film production from time to time. I've made connections with some people and they had stuff screening here. So when I saw that their stuff was playing, I was like, I'm going to see this. And I was very happy to see stuff that friends of mine have put out there in the world. And I, I was very entertained by both of them. I will also say on that front, kind of looking at the films from that perspective, uh, there was one that screened here from uh, Jericho Bridge, which was the guys, uh, one of the guys from Camp uh, Nightmare podcast, which we sat down and interviewed uh, their other co-host. But uh, their co-host Jordan uh, did this bridge, uh, and it was like an urban legend that was like, 10 minutes from where I grew up. So like getting to see that film was like super nostalgic for me. Yeah. It, it was a good b- chunk of blo- of short films that we were able to catch there at, at the four o'clock hour. So, and it should also be worth noting that, uh, one of our shorts from this year's horrific hope actually also screened this year, a uh, bloody bridal party, uh, two or bloody bridal shower too. Sorry. Yeah. That that was a good one. I didn't get to see it here, but I saw it at our festival. So, yeah. So, uh, some of the panels that we saw, uh, you got a chance to screen the um, Hocus Pocus panel, and uh, we can neither confirm nor deny that some of those stars might be making a guest appearance in a uh, episode or two here or there. Yeah, uh, I got I got to go to the Hocus Pocus panel and. Uh, it was very a very entertaining panel. It was Amari Katz, Vanessa Shaw, and Jason Marsden uh, talking about the movie. A lot of Q and A. A lot of people just asking questions to Binks the cat, which was interesting. Like, uh, and to his credit, Jason Marsden did the the Thackeray Banks voice and did the little old English accent. So it was it was pretty a pretty entertaining panel. They seemed to all get along. Uh, we got to meet a few of them afterwards um, in the lobby. Uh, I, hand, I went up to Jason Marsden to give him, our, give him our information to try to set up an interview for later. I handed, handed him the card, and he's like, oh, I don't care, and walked away. Just as a joke, but it was like the, the funniest moment of the, of the weekend. Um, but yeah, we, I'll, I'll confirm it. We got some interviews with, uh, with him, at least, and it was pretty entertaining. From- oh, well, we're spoiling it now. Mm-hmm. Well, we gotta give him something. <laughs> that's that's fair. Uh, yeah, he's probably one of the most animated actors I've ever had the chance of interviewing. And do, do, when you say that, do you mean animated like personality wise, or he's just voiced so many animated characters that he's the most animated? Oh, one hundred percent. Both. Okay. Uh, because like not only in, and I'll tease this for the interview. Like not only like when I, when I would like talk. Uh, you guys will see this on our YouTube page and we'll, when we post up this. Yeah. I, I will say that that's the one interview that if you're listening to the podcast, go check out the video for it because it is worth I made sure that I got every bit that he was doing during our interview. Yeah, when, when Alan says bit, like that's like appropriate because like there were like certain voices that like I touched on and like he did them on the spot. And I've just, I don't think I've ever actually interviewed a voice actor before. And if I have they didn't leave that kind of impression. Yeah, it was uh, it was very entertaining to watch. I couldn't really hear it because of where we were, <laughs> but it it was very entertaining to watch. Yeah, yeah. I uh, then we also got to see the uh, George A. Romero's Resident Evil uh, documentary announcement. Uh, we sat down with our writer and director, uh, Brandon. Uh, Salisbury this earlier this morning and I gotta say this is now quickly becoming probably one of my most anticipated upcoming releases yeah it's one of those things that I never knew about but I'm fascinated by the whole history of lost film and lost media so it's very interesting to see what a prolific filmmaker like George Romero was going to do with a video game in its early days like uh Resident Evil came out in 96. He was working on this in uh, the late 90s. So it was around the time of Resident Evil 2. And they even said in the panel, now we're on like Resident Evil 30. And it's it's still going. But to see what 
his vision was for the early days of this film. It's like if Steven Spielberg was working on a Mario movie in the 90s or in the 80s. So I don't want to spoil any like of his interview, but like I I know all a great deal about this just from like podcasts that like I listen to and this movie would have been truly great had Romero gotten the chance to make it. Like I just I couldn't picture a better filmmaker to do that film with and it's a huge disappointment that we didn't get it. Well, from the sound of the panel, they have some exciting things planned for the documentary that I think you'll get an I- a great idea of what that film was going to look like. We also got an exclusive first look at this with the trailer. Uh, probably when it comes to like DIY independent filmmaking, this is probably the best trailer I've ever seen. Yeah, it was something that they sh- screened exclusively here for uh, Creature Future Weekend. Um, so we saw it and you didn't, Nana Nana Boo Boo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was very entertaining. Um, sadly, we had to leave the panel so we could go get food of the tight schedule but uh the trailer was cool yeah uh also i mean we, we stayed for uh the majority of the panel but yeah you know we have to take care of our own bodies yeah uh and I, i'll probably say another thing about this weekend is like we got some like surprisingly like really deep conversations when it comes to like the mental health front like tim capullo uh from lost boys was a uh, uh, just such a huge shock now when you say tim capullo you have to make sure that people know he is the stax player from the lost boys uh and if you've seen the lost boys you know who we're talking about uh he had a really interesting conversation with us um and it got very personal and very quickly, ve- ve- very quickly and very informative and very honest but also very entertaining. Um, and that's another one I recommend checking out on our YouTube page because uh, he was very animated and was holding his saxophone the whole time. So uh, we are, we're actually going to be able to see him in concert tonight. So we'll have to add a little stinger to the end of this, uh, what we thought of that. <laughs> but yeah, that was a very interesting conversation. Um yeah, Victim No More also, they're screening here tonight as well. They're filmmakers that did a Friday the 13th uh, tribute slash fan film. That uh, that conversation also got equally pretty deep. Yeah, that one, um, that one was pretty deep too. They got really into their, their process for the film and uh, their process just in life. Uh, so, that, yeah, that one was very entertaining as well and very informative. Anything else you feel like we should talk about or should we jump into these interviews? Uh, the Her Show was cool. Oh, I forgot about the Her Show. Yeah, the Her Show was really cool. Some of the, uh, some of the, it was probably what, like eight, ten? I, at least ten. Yeah, so, like, it was, it was cool because, like, some of them, like, set up and, like, made, like, a, a monument almost out of it. It was really cool. One of them had the uh, the handbook for the recently deceased from Beetlejuice in there. Uh, check out our Instagram for the photos on that one. But yeah, some of them were just like kind of classic, kind of beat up. But it was is a cool time. The one had a, a casket with a dummy in it, and the dummy looked surprisingly like Regis Philbin to me. <laughs> so that was that was the weirdest part of that whole thing. Yeah, just just a little bit. It was very bizarre. Yeah, but uh, still very entertaining. I did not realize how many hearses are just Cadillacs. Yeah. I don't know much about hearses. I, I don't either, but, you know, I just I know they're sexy, and that's all that matters. Uh, I had a good pun earlier when we were at the hearse show. What was it? It was, uh, oh, as if my day couldn't get any hearse. I was proud of that one. And on that note, uh, we're going to present you guys with the interviews that we were able to uh, do this week, uh, this weekend. And uh, if you guys are ever in Gettysburg the last weekend in August, prioritize coming to Creature Feature. Uh, We do a lot of festivals and a lot of conventions, and this is probably easily top three favorite for me. And I will say... Just comparing it from last year to this year, seems to be growing. 
there seems to be a lot more people interested in this stuff. I think the I think the Hocus Pocus guests had a lot to do with that this year. So I'm interested. I'm interested to see who they get next year because it's always it's always something different. So. Well, he's talked about the, uh, so Craig, the the gentleman that runs this with his wife, talked about this last night uh, during the um, the the live commentary before they started. He introduced Mark and Jack and had said that um, you know he loves this that kind of experience for an audience. And uh, last year, I think was the first year they had done it, did it with Children of the Corn, and said that this year they uh, not only did they do two. Uh, but this year as well, that uh, with Nightmare, it really seemed to be actually increasing. Yeah, it, um, crowd-wise, there um, there were a lot more Sanderson sisters this year, at least. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot more. There was a wider weight, ra- range of ages here this year too. Like a lot of people brought their kids to meet the cast of Hocus Pocus, so that was kind of cool. And I, I don't think they many of them brought their kids to see. Um, the sax player from the Lost Boys, but we'll see you tonight at the concert. So it's nothing but kids. Yeah. Uh, no, I I also think too. There's like there there's you talked about growth earlier, and this is like the not only are they doing multiple things, but there's there is literally multiple things that they're doing because they're while we're getting ready to go uh, screen a movie, they're only a few minutes away from doing uh, a drive-in styled showing of Hocus Pocus. They have also, they also did uh, trick or treat earlier this year. Earlier this this evening, they had a costume contest. So they're they're trying to kind of have stuff that's going to be for horror fans of all uh, ages and uh, people that love all genres. Yeah, it's um, I can see this event outgrowing the space it's in now, but that's in the future, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I always love coming to this festival, this festival and this convention every year. Um, it's uh, it's one of my most anticipated uh, events day each 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 time. So uh, make sure that you guys uh, check the links in the bios. Follow them on social media. We're gonna jump into this interview. At this these interviews. Have a great night. If you guys are fans of Movies like I am, you guys know that a lot of movies never see the light of day and carry on a legacy of their own. And I'm here today with a gentleman who is exploring one of said projects and possibly one of the most famous of the projects from the last 30 years. It's George A. Romero's uh, unmade Resident Evil film. And this is Mr. Brandon Salisbury. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm pretty good, too. Uh, so tell me a little bit about, uh, obviously, what who you, what, what your real role in the movie is. I, um, I'm the writer and director of the documentary, along with uh, another co-writer. Um, right now, we're in the middle of production, and we're just trying to, you know, tell George's story and kind of tell what happened, what he had in mind, and... Um, you know, just show people the truth of what what happened. This story is crazy. Yeah, uh, I, I've I've listened to several podcasts on this unmade movie, and it is just it is wild. Yeah, a lot of the information out there though isn't entirely accurate. Um, more, more or less, what people are saying is kind of true, but there's a lot of half truths. There's a lot of additional information that people don't realize. Uh, one of the things that, just as a glimpse into the project, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that George Romero sought out Bernie Wrightson to do concept art. That's how far he got into it. So, usually people are like, "Wow, there was concept art for the film," and it's like, "Yes." So, so it's just uh, like there's half truths. We've actually seen outright lies uh, from the time when he was fired, and it, it's really, um, really nice to finally kind of get the truth out there, so that uh, people really have the real information. And it's not coming from me; it's coming from the people that were with George around that time. Now, correct me if I am 
uh, wrong, but didn't the like the whole project like it started with a Japanese commercial that he had done for Resident Evil Two, I believe. Yes, uh, in 1997, Capcom hired him to direct a 1.5 million dollar live action commercial for Resident Evil Two, and Capcom wanted him from the beginning because he's the Godfather of the Dead. You know, created all this, and Resident Evil is inspired by George's work. So, they hired him to do this commercial. They had uh, some of the, they had some pretty big name talent involved in it, and uh, from there, Capcom immediately went to Constantine Film because uh, at that time they were with Alan B. McElroy scripting it, and they just said, "No, let George Romero write and direct it." Capcom was completely behind George Romero doing the movie. So another thing too about this movie is that uh, I'm I'm curious like there's hundreds of movies that just never see the light of day, never get made. What is it specifically about George A. Romero's Resident Evil that you guys were like, we want to follow this journey and see where it takes us? Well, one of the things was just being a fan of George Romero. I wanted to take uh, something that he felt was one of his biggest regrets and just kind of show people just how much love and care that he had for this project because he had his he wasn't a video gamer but he had his assistant uh jason bearford uh play the video game and they recorded it and he would re-watch all the footage and take notes and actually implement it this script that he wrote had all the characters it had almost every single monster from the game it was very gory it was scary claustrophobic it felt like the video game so for me it's an it's interesting to see his creative um creative differences you know the things that he changed from the game to make the script work better but it's also um just it's just a really cool project to think that george a romero who created dawn of the dead and creep show and essentially created the zombie genre was going to adapt the video game and take it from just a a low budget B movie video game which is a hell of a lot of fun but to take that and elevate it to like his level of horror with social commentary and subtext now I'm not a gamer by any stretch of the imagination I feel I feel that when George A. Romero is like you know what I'm gonna hire someone else to play this but I, I respect him enough to be like you know that he was wanting to like go through and like watch the game and like watch other people play it I think that's awesome and so I haven't read the script I'm assuming you making the documentary you've read the script it is right here in front of us what are your thoughts on the script versus what we actually got in 2002 I it's hard for me to judge because it is only a first draft um Romero would have obviously gone through additional rewrites had he not been fired so soon. But it's definitely got more of the feel of Resident Evil. It's got puzzles and traps, and you get to see the tyrant and the hunters and all these things that you just really haven't seen in any live-action adaptation of Resident Evil. And I thought it's a brilliant script. It's a lot of fun. It's claustrophobic. It's just really, really cool. So I wish um, this one had been made. I wish Constantine had believed in George enough to let him follow it through. It's kind of heartbreaking, like, hearing the stories about this movie and, like, actually, like, seeing what we got. Uh, not saying that, like, I'm just not a fan of the, the, the Resident Evil movies that Paul W. Uh, Anderson has, has created. That's, I respect you if you, if you are a fan of that that's just not my cup of tea but yeah like i said like george a. romero man like i mean the man is like the godfather of the zombies like he's the, the creator and to have him at the helm feels like uh just such a travesty yeah it um i was very upset back in uh 1999 when it came out that he was going to be not doing the movie anymore resident evil had reignited my love for george romero uh i grew up more or less watching some of Romero's films but I was terrified of them and Resident Evil got me into like okay I need to go back and rewatch Night and Dawn and Day and 
really, and I became a George fanatic after that. I love his work, and it is a tragedy that this was never made. This, this was like a turning point in his career where, you know, he should have been the one to see this through because Resident Evil brought back the zombie genre and then to kind of be removed from a project and have someone else um because because resident evil the movie did help reignite the zombie genre again in cinema but he should have been the one to do it so one of the things that when you're talking about video game adaptations that we often hear is that there's like there's a curse around video game adaptations they just fall really flat and we've seen some like cool adaptations in the last few years with like you know detective pikachu and sonic but these are family gear films, and so we we haven't seen like a true like blood. Well, I guess Mortal Kombat. But do you think this movie could have broken the uh, had it been made? Would it have broken the curse surrounding the subgenre of film? I think it would have. I there was enough care into it. There was uh, a lot of one of the things that fans hate is Easter eggs and fan service where it's a lot of cursory things uh, like oh here uh, one of the things that was leveled at the the remake of Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City was how they they would do things like show you the the cheeseburger from Resident Evil 2 with the wrapper and all these like surface level Easter eggs and fan service Fans wanted something more, and it was great to see that George took the time to uh, realistically insert things that fans love without uh, trying to make it fan service. Everything felt logical, and had he made this, it would have felt like a Resident Evil movie should. Man, you got me all excited for this. So you guys are in production for this movie right now. Where can people find it online? Are you guys running a Kickstarter? Can people donate to the movie? Uh, we're going to have more information regarding that soon. Uh, we do have some offers on the table for things that are going on. We have a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Uh, our little soft announcement uh, kind of got the ball rolling with even more uh, behind the scenes stuff. So we're going to have more information forthcoming in the, the coming months. Um, we have a major block of filming coming on. One of the things that we want to do with this is we don't want to just um, sit someone in, in a chair against a, a wall, blank wall, and do interviews. I want to go to an abandoned mansion, get that creepy Resident Evil Spencer Estate mansion feel of it, and we want to shoot it like a horror film with these uh, interviews. And on top of that, one of the things we're seeking to do is film about five scenes from the script. And we're not talking about dialogue-heavy scenes. We're talking about the stuff that fans want to see. So that's just some of the things that are in the works, and it's a lot of negotiations and deals. And But right now we have uh, Capcom behind us on this. Uh, we have an agreement with them. Uh, Suze Romero, who is uh, George's widow, she gave us her blessings on this. She thinks it's a great project. She's waiting to see what we can do. Well, I'm excited to see this movie. I was really excited to, to, to see you guys here this weekend. I thank you so much for your time, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you can make the panel 5 p.m. We're going to unveil a, a teaser trailer for it and give more information. You had me a teaser trailer. It's, it's pretty kick-ass. I am biased, but it's pretty <laughs> kick-ass. All right, well, you guys uh, be on the lookout for George A. Romero's uh, Resident Evil movie. This documentary is coming soon to a theater near you. If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, and as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide 
Lifeline, which is 1 800 273 8255. You can also text HELP to 741 741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please. If you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because, once again, you have value and you have worth. So please... Stay with us. What's going on, ghouls and gals? I'm here with Malachi from Horror Gods, a clothing line, as you guys can see before me, uh, that is dealing in uh, some, like, like hip-hop, classic, you know, fashion. I I don't know. How how would you describe the the style? Uh, So, yeah, with the Horror Gods, we pay tribute to the gods of horror. Uh, It's all hand-drawn, original artwork. Uh, yeah, his style is kind of like streetwear, I guess, but, uh, you know, we don't limit it to that. We try to make everything for everybody, you know, we're all inclusive, so uh, we just pride ourselves on the originality of the artwork, you know? So I say hip-hop because specifically for this Candyman design, the Cenobites design, yes. kind of just feels like old school, like 90s, like hip-hop. So, yes, this one we did it like the graffiti because of the Candyman graffiti. And my artist is actually from Oakland, California. So, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but the art out there is amazing. Um, and in this, yes, I'm a big Memphis Underground fan. So this was my little incorporation with that. So that's why you see the album covers and stuff. So that's a little bit of part of me in there. <laughs> All right. So I have to I have to ask, what was the first design? What, what kicked it off for you guys? Oh, man, that's shit. What was the first design? Design, now, it wasn't my logo? Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, shit, man. I know the the Chucky knife pin. That was our first pin we ever came up with. Um, what was the first shirt? Damn, dude. It was either one of the... No, it was... Uh, Smile Now Dilator, I think, was our first shirt design that wasn't our logo yeah yep see we've been we've been coming out with so many different things i can't even keep up with it but yeah i'm pretty sure the smile now is probably one of our first well let's talk about the uh let's talk about the other accessories you guys have here the pins are really cool because the pins are uh interactive yes they are very interactive they're limited to 100 too so very highly collectible we got a spinner pin a comic book, uh, Candyman with a mirror in its mouth, this Chucky finger bobbles, this hand grows, Freddy's face slides. We try to do something interactive with all of them. Uh, we got some slides, toys. We try to, we're trying to dabble into everything, to be honest. Tote bags, accessories that guys, women, uh, male and female can use, you know. So what point did you guys uh, decide, you know, I want to get into sandals. I want to get into uh, hats, socks. From the beginning, man, we want to do everything, like I said, that anybody can use. We don't want to limit it to, you know, just shirts or pins. We want to give it a little bit of dabble of everything because we have all the ideas, you know. So that was pretty much it. Is there any design that you have that you love that's not here? No, I think we're we're I think we're stocked up on everything. We are running a little low on some things, but no, I don't think there's anything that we had. You know what? Pennywise. We have a Pennywise pin that lights up with the dead lights in his mouth. We are out of those. I wish we still had those. Those are pretty popular. Sounds incredible. They they are cool. <laughs> I have some. They just don't light up anymore because the battery died. So it's like five left. They're rare now, I guess. You guys heard it here first. Well, these are really awesome shirts, and I, you guys want to have to plug your social media now. Oh, yeah. You can catch us anywhere, Horror Gods, on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I make little, if you like music, the, the rap stuff, I make horror movies mixed with the Memphis rap. Trippy, glitched out, if you like that. Uh, yeah, Twitter, we're on everything. Horror Gods. All right, well, you guys check the show notes below. Check out Horror Gods. 
coming to a festival near you. All right, we are back at Creature Feature, Victims and Villains here, Captain Nostalgia, and I am sitting here with comic creator and artist, Mr. Mike Knievel. Hey there. How are you doing today? Lovely. We, uh, we haven't gotten started yet, but we're, it's, a, it's a good start. <laughs> it's always fun to plug your, plug your stuff before you actually sell your stuff. That is exactly right, <laughs> yes. Because I've actually just got back to my table from spending money, so it'll be great to make some to justify that. I understand that. That's an issue. I always have these kind of conventions. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I, I used to do a lot more shows per year, and it got to the point where I was I was probably spending my earnings before I got home. And I'm older now, and I have a mortgage and a family, so <laughs> I bought one thing, and now I just have to sell, sell, sell in order to make that you know non-divorceable. Yeah, dude, I, I understand that completely. All right, so I'm also joined by Plot Twist. This is a dual interview. Uh, I'm also joined by Amanda Headley. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm well. Is this your first time here? Uh, no, this is my second year. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Returning. Yay. Oh, man. Cool, cool. All right. So you are an author making novels and novella. Does this count as a novella? No, novel. It's a novel. So novelist. Cool, cool. Yes. yes. Dark, dark fiction creator. Let's talk about, let's talk about your comics first. Uh, how long you been? Uh, tell us a little bit about the titles and how long you've been doing them. Uh, got my start in the early '90s, and uh, probably my my first major big claim to fame is uh, I did a zombie comic with Bill Heinzman, who was the first zombie you ever see in the movie Night of the Living Dead. He wrote it, and I drew it, and we we did a, a, a limited run of it, and it really jump started things for me, which was great, you know. And from there, it's I've just been locked into horror comics, which I have no problem with. I it's it's my wheelhouse. Um, I've worked on a bunch of anthologies, you know, short stories in comics, Tales from the Crypt style, EC style, and then, you know, full lengths. Uh, we just relaunched. We had a real popular book in, in the early 2000s called Gory Lori, and uh, we, we left Lori behind for a couple years, but we're relaunching her this summer in a new book called Second Twisted. And that's me and Joseph Monks, who was the co-creator of Cry for Dawn. And uh, so that's what I'm here promoting, that, and, uh, you know, I'm also a part of the crew from Michael Graves, who used to be the singer of the Misfits, and when I'm not here, I'm touring with him and hanging out with him, and I do a bunch of art for him, and anything, I'm a Swiss Army knife when it comes to that band, so, so that's basically what I'm here, I'm here to spread the great name of Michael Graves and also peddle some nasty comic books that would have upset Frederick Wortham when he was writing Seduction of the Innocent. So I, I have to plug this because uh, I, I co-host a podcast about Nicolas Cage. Okay. And uh, my co-host for that is like, is into like big into that scene and loves the Misfits. So uh, I, I think he might be slightly jealous. Well, that's good. Yeah, come back tomorrow. I'll have my acoustic guitar here and I'll just, I'll just randomly play the whole Misfits catalog since, you know, I'm off. I'm off. There's not a tour happening right now. Um, that tour kicks back up in, in September. So I'm just jumping on the, the convention circuit, but listen, I'll, I'll bring my guitar and uh, we'll we'll do some uh, misfits acoustic kumbaya behind the table, and you'll really piss off your co-host. Maybe we get that as like an exclusive for us. Yeah, exactly. Listen, I mean, you, you're doing me this solid, so yeah, I could probably I could probably get back in music mode for an afternoon. All right, and uh, switching gears to you, Amanda, you have two books that you're selling here. One is kind of first novel, my debut novel. Uh, this is my debut novel, Till We Become Monsters. It released last year in June. Um, if you like stories about family dysfunction, cannibalism, and folklore, this is your kind of story. Um, everyone seems to enjoy it, and they get really creeped out and grossed out by it. So, it makes me happy. I I'm not intimidated by this book. This book sounds amazing. I'm intimidated by the size of this book. Oh, that's a that's an anthology collection that I have one short story in, so I'm just liquidating my stock of that one. <laughs> Fair, I understand that. Uh, so I have to ask because I have I also realize like some parallels in my own uh, stories when I'm when, like watching like family themed horror, any biographical like any biographical uh, nature. 
Um, not really. Like, it, it's about sibling rivalry and kind of like what happens when it's left unchecked into adulthood, the consequences that come of it. Um, it's not biographical. I know they're like, I had a sister growing up, siblings fight. So I think some of that, you know, childhood fighting between siblings, I drew a little bit from that, but not much. I tried to keep my family out of it. All right. Well, here's a question for both of you guys. So uh, you guys are listening to this. You guys can also check it out. Check this out on our YouTube page as well. But uh, for fans that people that listeners right now, what what horror movie would you say is closest to your content? Oh, that's that's a challenge. I mean, because. I usually just draw the scripts that are given to me, which tend to be a lot more gory. I mean, the closest would probably be like Evil Dead, except it's a female lead. Whereas my sensibilities are much more like Carol Lombard and Supernatural. (laughs) Well, I mean, 2013 gave us a female-led Evil Dead, so... Yes, that's exactly right. All right, and you, Amanda? Uh, Movies that are kind of akin to what this would be. Um... I guess probably one of the most recent movies would be Antlers. Um, you know, it doesn't quite have, like, the vicious sibling rivalry, but there is a, a kind of a familial bond in that movie. But, you know, maybe the monsters kind of share some aspects. All right. Well, uh, before we plug social media, let's do a sudden death battle. Are you guys ready? Not really, but let's do it. That's what uh, sudden all right, so Terrifier 2 releases in a couple of weeks. And who wins in a battle between Pennywise or Art the Clown? Pennywise. All right, all right. A Pennywise, definitely. <laughs> well, you heard it here first. Uh, we have two for Pennywise. And listen, there's no offense, men. I mean,. Basically, at the at the end of uh, spoiler alert for anyone who's never read Stephen King, I mean, he basically turns out to be like Cthulhu at the end. I mean, that that's slightly beyond just demonic clown. That kind of like broke my brain the first time I read that book. I was like, this is so different than what I was giant promised. Space turtles, giant space turtles fighting Cthulhu clowns. Yeah, like, I mean, listen, it's not, I'm I'm not picking favorites. I, I'm really not, but. They basically turned him into an old one by the end of the book. That's fair. Do you have any defense for Pennywise? I've actually, he took my words right out of my mouth because, yeah, that's why I'm a huge Pennywise fan. I mean, I terrified of clowns and I love Cthulhu, so you know, it's a little mash up there, but that was literally what I was going to say. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. And Space Turtles. Well, uh, one of the things that we always like to engage in when we do these conventions is specifically talk about mental health because we believe that the more we talk about it, the more it deconstructs the stigma surrounding mental health. Um, and yours is really interesting talking about sibling rivalry. Can you guys talk about how the there's like mental health is woven into your book? Yeah, and actually um, there is a portion of my book that takes place in an asylum because... Um, this one child does get committed um, for some actions that, you know, kind of occurred leading up to it. Um, and I do play a lot on abuse and, um, you know, children who are kind of going through the mentality of not being understood and um, constantly kind of getting pushed aside and what that does to them. Um, and which kind of unfortunately leads this child to being put into asylum for a little bit. So, yeah, it is definitely a. It's very psychological. I like to hear that. Same question. Talk about the mental health in your, your books. I, I would love to say there's some sort of silver lining, but generally the writers I work with are like, how can we upset people? I mean... <laughs> it happens to the best of us. It, it's true. I mean, listen, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm personally very concerned about and, you know, and invested in. Which is why, like, I mean, I've turned down scripts that I thought were way too visceral because I know, I mean, th- this entire scene at every level, whether you're talking about people who are selling paper products or selling masks or selling toys, it, it, it absolutely is a magnet to a very specific group of people. 
and I am hyper aware of that, you know, in terms of not wanting to, to, to trigger things or, or maybe be demonstrative of things that would there, seem like I'm doing them for the sake of entertainment value, whereas they're actually a walking crisis for some people who are in this audience. Yeah, absolutely. I like horror for me for like when I first got into it was like a magnet for like my anger, my aggression and uh, realized kind of how unhealthy that was and had to spend several years away from the genre and kind of now am just starting to get back into it. Yeah, I mean, I, I started as a teenager. I got my first paying comic job while I was still in high school. And I mean, I, I was beyond angry, but I really ended up having therapy through it because a lot of the background characters that started getting mutilated looked an awful lot like people I was mad at. And be, through that, all of a sudden, I was able to just let it go, you know? I mean, I took it all out with pen and ink. <laughs> yeah, I get that, man, 100%. So thank you for sharing a little bit of your, your past. All right, well, let's, uh, let's jump into, this is the question. Anyone watching this right now, anyone that is like, you know what? I want to check out this book. I want to check out these comics. Where can people find you guys online? Um, I'm at Instagram and Twitter at Amanda Headley. Um, Facebook at auth- author Amanda Headley. And my website's amandaheadley.com. Simple enough. Hers is real simple because she doesn't have a Polish last name, so I have to do spelling. I have a website. It's Mike Kniefel, which is M-I-K-E-K-O-N-E-F-U-L dot com, Mike Kniefel dot com, or Instagram dot com slash Mike Kniefel, again, K-O-N-E-F-U-L, for that otherwise impossible last name. Well, I thank you both for taking time out from this uh, this year's Creature Feature to talk about your book, talk about mental health, and talk about creepy clowns. Exactly. Thank you so much. All right, well, you guys check the links in the show notes below, and... Uh, pick up the comics, pick up the books. We'll come in out with you guys with more coverage. What's going on, guys? I'm sitting here with Ethan Steyer. He is the writer director behind the short film uh, Mimicry, which just screened here at Creature Feature. How are you doing today, friend? I'm really excited. This is my first film that's been screened at a movie theater, so this is a first experience in many ways. My first interview as well. So, yeah, lots of lots of V cards being broken here today. Uh, <laughs> but uh, tell us a little bit about this film. Uh, so this film was basically me. Um, I always like the idea of like questioning reality, like the um, this whole idea of like questioning your own truth, the way you view the world. So I guess uh, my my film idea was really just um, based around that idea of is anything real? Or do you have any way of knowing if, if your world is real? So yeah, I think one of the most impressive shots in this movie is like within the first few minutes uh you guys set up a mirror shot and i always have to say like mirror shots to me as like a cinephile like intimidate the mess out of me so can you kind of talk about some of the trickier shots in this movie i would say yeah the mirror shot was definitely tricky um the lighting was also tricky because all the shots were at night so i had to figure out how to make the lighting look like it was at least sort of daytime which is hard when you're running off of uh you know light or house lighting sorry um so yeah, that was between that and the mirror. Those were pretty tricky. So this movie, uh, the weapon of the protagonist's weapon of choice is a hammer. Uh, was that always kind of the the go to idea for it, or had you guys kind of played around and considered other possible household items to be the weapon of choice? I guess the hammer was really my only my only idea. That was my go to, um, really, just because it's meant to break things in a lot of cases. And those, you know, made sense. Uh, also, so with this one, too, uh, we had the pleasure of meeting your dad yesterday and your parents. So uh, your dad stars in this movie. So what is it like to have the roles reversed and you give him direction? It's definitely interesting. <laughs> um, although it, I'd say it helps because I know the way he reacts to certain ideas when you ask him to do something. You know, if uh, I can expect him to react a certain way if I direct him in a certain way. So I think that definitely helped the direction process. So between that and my mom helping, that I think that made it a lot smoother. So what was it? What was what kind of made you want to pursue filmmaking for this kind of being, you know, your first feature, your first interview, your first uh, film festival? Like, what made you want to pursue filmmaking? I guess it really all started with my parents being in filmmaking, and I kind of 
found myself growing an eye for just like looking at things through the, the eye of a filmmaker. And I really just like the idea of, st- of telling a story with the camera. It's always fascinated me. All right. Well, uh, this is your first, which uh, for most filmmakers, this is not their last. Is this one screening at any other film festivals coming up? This might be screening in Cannes World Film Festival. We'll see. I'm not uh, announced to be a winner yet, but I'm a finalist. So we'll see how that turns out. All right. Well, where can people find you online until you so to follow your long year announcements? Um, I'm on Facebook, Ethan Steyer. That's that's about all I have online. Yep. Well, thank you for your time, sir. And uh, if you guys get a chance to make sure that you guys check out the short film Mimicry. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations. Educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And to get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains, or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Here at Victims and Villains, we love to support independent films, and as if our film festival, Horrific Hope, wasn't evidence of that enough, we're here with an independent filmmaker, Mr. Uh, Chris O'Brocky, who is uh, here as the ringmaster. Did I get that right? Yes. All right. Promoting the new independent movie... Shriek Show. So, tell us a little bit about this movie. Well, this movie is a throwback to classic tales such as Creep Show and Trick or Treats with a little splash of Halloween thrown in there. And it's uh, four friends decide to venture into a haunted amusement park that's supposedly abandoned. But it turns out that they it is not abandoned and not what it seems. So, they soon encounter myself and their night of fun turns into a night of terror, I should say. And are you, like, a surprise for the, the, the movie? <laughs> I'm a surprise everywhere I go. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so you got to, jumping out of just, just Shriek Show, you have a wider range. It looks like you have been making films for quite some time. Well, I've been, been mostly been a production assistant on many of these movies. Now, the the... All these films here were directed by director Brad Twig, so I assist him when I can. But I serve as produ- a producer and production designer on a few of them. Well, what kind of surprises can we expect with Shriek Show? Oh, you can expect many surprises. It's a more of a different, sort of a new Halloween adventure. I mean, why should Halloween just be for Michael Myers, even though he is a king and him tyrant in himself? So we'll just say with Shriek Show, expect the unexpected, and the ringmaster is just cracking his knuckles, and you have not seen the last of him yet. So you talk about uh, comparing this movie to both Creep Show, also Trick or Treat, which are, I would argue, two kind of different anthology films, yes. but none of the anthology films, whereas Trick or Treat kind of ties everything together in the ends. Uh, Creep Show is just kind of a classic anthology. So, which one do you guys lean more towards? I would say this leans a little more towards Trick or Treat. Are you the uh, connecting factor? Yes, I'm definitely one of them. Are you the master of mayhem? Yes, of course. So, you look I like all the shots with the clowns. We also too have this like uh, energy about you that like if if we have Shriek Show. That implies that there could be a Shriek Show 2, 3, etc. Kind of like Terrifier and Art the Clown. Oh yes, Art the Clown is, is his own monster in his own right. I have a respect for him. Well, the Ringmaster has been around a little longer than that, we should say. Centuries, I would, I would say. 
All right. Well, my last question for you guys is where can people follow the film and find it online? Well, we have it available right here in the format of DVD and Blu-ray. We also have it available on Amazon Prime, on Plex, several other streaming services. I think Tubi will be our next one. All right. Well, you guys heard it here first. Make sure you guys check out Shriek Show, wherever you guys get your movies from, or click the links in the show notes below. Thank you guys for your time. You're welcome. Uh, we survived. Hello, I'm standing here with Mark Patton from A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, but more importantly, uh, the documentary that you all should watch called Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street. How are you doing? Thank you very much. That's really nice of you to say that. I'm, I'm super proud of Scream Queen. So uh, It is probably one of my top five things that Shudder's ever put out. Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm going to actually, I'm doing a thing for Shudder right now called Queer for Fear, which is, uh, is a, a series, a documentary series, which is fun. And they have some really interesting people, good people for that. Well, I have access to that, so I might, I might actually have to watch that later tonight. Uh, so my, my first question for you with, uh, obviously, this, uh, this legacy that you've kind of built into it, uh, is how has that kind of affected you know your mental health oh my mental health i don't know it's like it's it's a different world completely for me i mean I, when i decided to return to this kind of world it was a pretty big decision uh with scream queen i did it so i could make scream queen basically um and i've always had pretty good mental health i'm i'm a um I'm a survivor. I'm tough. I'm like I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a Nancy boy, or I am a Nancy boy actually, because I like I will. At the end, ask those guys. I will. I can hold a grudge for about forty years and like follow through on it. But uh, I'm good. I'm I'm excited now because I'm making a lot of new films, which is great. That's awesome to hear. Uh, so the reason I ask specifically is because we're a publication that specializes in talking about mental health through pop culture and that's the reason why i find your documentary so compelling um and i rewatched it thursday in prep for seeing you today this weekend i'm really excited about the the commentary tonight but it's really really heartbreaking the the ending of that i'm not going to talk about it because it, i want people to check out the documentary uh but can you kind of talk about the experience of making that documentary Oh, sure. The, well, you know, it's so, so funny because a lot of that that I, when we started making the documentary, the documentary, by the way, took five years to make and about a half a million dollars. And I thought it would be like $10,000 in a couple of weeks. And then we'd go to the Academy Awards and I'd win. And, you know, it was just a fantasy. It was a fantasy. But um, I was resolved with a lot of that before I started the documentary until I started making the documentary. And then I got angry. And I got angry about what I had given up. Like, as an adult, I knew how close to, like, real stardom I was. Uh, that I had accomplished so much. And that I'd let this little, I hate to say it, but like, this little troll man um, make me step out of my own life. Uh, that made me angry. And then it was interesting the way that people got... Uh, like Jack. Jack in the movie does not come off in a great way, the director. And um, I always, when I, I, when I met him and I was working with him, he was very much what he is, which is like he's sort of a misogynist. He's, you know, like the older dude, you know, the, the school teacher. And I always felt like there was something wrong with me for being annoyed by what he was doing to me. Now I'm a grown-up, and he still t does it. I mean, he still tries it. He, he can't leave enough alone. Like, he's got to make a joke. Like, if you say, that really hurt my feelings, and I was really uncomfortable with that, then he doubles down and goes back in. 
And I figure, well, you're 70 years old and you haven't figured it out by now, then you're just not going to. And I, but uh, it's it's all been a healing journey. I mean, that's that's the truth of it. You know, it's like I lived through HIV, AIDS. Uh, I see. You know, I have the wisdom of being an older person now, so I see what's happening now in society, and I worry. I get worried for young gay kids. I get worried for people who haven't resolved their issues yet because we're going to go through a really tough time again. And it's going to be a fight, and we'll probably win it. But I think a lot of the younger people don't know how to fight anymore. So I figure the job of the grown-ups is to tell them what's coming and give them the tools and know that you'll still be here no matter what. I mean, they can't get rid of gay people. You know, they've tried, but they can't. So. So my last question for you involves the, uh, when you guys, oh, let, me, let me rephrase this. My last question is for anyone either listening to this or watching this right now that might be going through some of the things that you went through, what, were the, what are the words you would say to them? Oh, I'd say just hang on and call me on Instagram. I talk to everybody. <laughs> so, you know, it's like if you need a friend, I'm there. I'm good. Um, I just like to say perseverance and growing up is, you know, I the thing I say to a lot of people is like the world is a tough place. Nobody told you it was going to be easy. It's not. But the minute you accept that, it's all good. You know what I mean? It's like uh, there, there are people in the world who are in real serious danger, you know, and that's a different category altogether. And um, there are people that get placed in their way to help them. But if you're just having the life crisis of growing up in the closet or you're just a normal nerd, um, you know, it all works out in the end. And uh, the, the weirdest people end up with the best lives, so you know. So there you go. It's like you're not popular in high school. Don't worry about it. You got another 80 years to be popular. So, yeah true stories well you guys make sure that you guys check out scream queen my nightmare on elm street where can people follow you online in the meantime um just google mark Patton and wherever it leads you i'm there All right you heard it here first mark thank you so much for your time thank thank you very much i appreciate it that was the first half of our interviews we are going to be uh bringing you guys more coverage this uh saturday and the Hocus Pocus interviews that we teased, we're actually going to save those for the end of the month in anticipation for Hocus Pocus uh, 2, which will be streaming at the end of the month on Disney+. Plus. But, Alan, where can people find you online? People can find me at You Have to Watch This Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. We live stream our shows every Tuesday. They're available the next day on all major podcasting platforms. But if you're interested in just me personally, you can find me on Instagram at a cram a c r a m m four eight one five uh people can find me there and you guys can uh follow me on letterboxd i'm at captain nostalgia and you guys can follow our parent company victims and villains we are on facebook instagram twitter twitch patreon patreon uh, and uh, wherever you guys get your podcast from, including our uh, mental health resource library, all of which you guys can find links for in the show notes below. We'll be back this Saturday talking about more creature features.